you don't have a sense of how much your mind wanders around until you give it one thing to think about. And then you find all these other thoughts running into that one thing. And you begin to get a sense of how out of control your mind can be. So you can't leave it there. If you go through life with very little control over your thoughts, then as you leave this life, who knows where your thoughts are going to take you? This is why restraint is such an important part of the practice. It's something you do while you're meditating and something you do while you're not meditating. While you're meditating, of course, you sit here quietly. You're not going to be saying anything. You're not going to be doing anything with the body. All the activities with the mind. And you want to make sure your mind doesn't go wandering off into places where it shouldn't go. At times when you're not sitting here, then you exercise what's called restraint of the senses. You have to be very careful about how you look at things, how you listen to things, how you go for different flavors, how you go for different tactile sensations, smells, thoughts. Because it's one thing to behave yourself while you're doing formal meditation, and then another thing to behave yourself when you're out in the world as before. It's like the difference between having a teacher in a room full of students, and the students work on their homework, and then the teacher leaves the room, and the students start acting up. Or when the students are in school, and when the students leave school. The difference here, of course, is that with little kids you have to give them some, some freedom. But your mind, if it has too much freedom, can do all kinds of bad things with that freedom. Of course, we are looking to free the mind eventually, but we're trying to free it from our defilements. But up until that point, a lot of times freedom will going to mean giving freedom rein to your defilements, which you don't want. So there has to be some restraint. We may feel confined by the restraint, but remember that even measureless goodwill, measureless compassion, measureless empathetic joy, measureless equanimity, those are forms of restraint. You develop these measureless attitudes, so be very careful about what you do. You realize if you really do have goodwill for all beings, you don't want to harm them. That means you have to say no to any random thoughts, any random words, acts that could possibly cause harm. You have to be circumspect. I remember a while back I was talking to a student who came to the States when she was a teenager. She learned English. and was, became quite good at English. And one day we had a question and answer session and happened to mention that she tried, should try to be more circumspect. And she said in all her years here in America she had never heard that word. It gives you something to think about. Circumspection is not something that we excel in. We don't even talk about it. We don't even give it lip service, much less actual observation in our thoughts, words, and deeds. But it's a very important quality. The Thai equivalent, Kwam Rob Cobb, is the John Lee's definition of one of the bases for success, the one that has to do with using your powers of discernment. And that's a lot of what discernment is. It's not just seeing distinctions or seeing connections between things, but it's also seeing what are the ramifications of what you do. And you begin to realize that things start very quickly by your decision to look at something in a certain way or to listen to something in a certain way. The Buddha makes a distinction. There are certain pleasures in the world that are perfectly okay. They don't have a bad effect on the mind. But there are other pleasures that are going to 
wreak havoc in your mind, give rise to unskillful states, and you have to hold yourself back. But it's not just the pleasures themselves, it's how you approach them. There are lots of things in the world that you can look at in ways that are perfectly innocent, have very little impact on the mind. Or you can look at the same things looking for trouble, basically. There are times when you give into thoughts of resentment, or thoughts of nostalgia, thoughts of regret, thoughts of lust, aversion. And then these things go out looking for more food to strengthen their hold on the mind. And you're sometimes willing to give in to them. That's what you've got to watch out for. Because if you give in to them, they become more and more habitual. There is that voice in the mind, say, when lust comes up, and it tells you, if you don't give in to me, you'll never be rid of me. And we believe it, even though even giving in to it means it's going to come back. Well, the same with anger. If you don't give in to it, it's just going to keep haunting you, coming, nipping at your heels. So you might as well give in now and be done with it. Indulge in those thoughts of anger. But again, as you indulge in these things, they become more and more habitual. And you have to watch out for your habits, especially when, at times when the mind feels weak, when you're physically very tired or sometimes very sick. Your old habitual ways are going to show up. And so you have good habits to show up at that time. Because after all, as the body gets to the point where it's going to die, the extent to which you are able to depend on the strength of the body to keep yourself going, it's going to fall out, it's going to fall away. And it's totally up to the mind at that point. Again, the habits of the mind will come in and take over. So you want to develop good habits now. And the good habits start with how you look at things, how you listen to things, and all the way down the six senses. So you have to look at your engagement in the senses, and that means your engagement with the world as a whole, in terms of where you're coming from, what your motivation is, and then look at the results of engaging the senses in that way. In other words, look at it in terms of a cause and effect chain of cause and effect. Don't just give in to your impulses. Don't just give in to your likes and dislikes. If you indulge in them, ask yourself, well, where are they going to lead you? And what's your motivation? This is where you get into that question of what's the allure? And then what are the drawbacks? And if you look in those terms, then there's a possibility that you're going to get to what the Buddha calls the escape. When you say that even though you may like certain things, they're going to cause, cause trouble down the line. Now some of us are pretty resistant even to that. We say, I don't care about the trouble down the line. All I care about is right now. And the idea that the Buddha teaches you, well, just focus on right now and don't think about the future, don't think about the past, it gives fuel to that idea. But the Buddha never taught that. He basically taught the distinction between what's skillful and what's unskillful. And our basic motivation for doing what's skillful, he said, is heedfulness. And heedfulness does think about future consequences. It's because of heedfulness that we have a sense of compunction, realizing that you should care about the consequences of your acts. So when there's the impulse to say something or the impulse to look at something, ask yourself, where is this impulse coming from? Don't just give in. It's in this way that you can exercise restraint as you're going around throughout the day. Now, as the Buddha said, to exercise restraint over the senses, you need some 
something to hold the mind in place. You know the image of the six animals. You've got a dog, you've got a hyena, a crocodile, a bird, a monkey, a snake. You tie leashes on all of them, and then you tie all the leashes together. And if those leashes are not tied to something more solid, then they'll just pull and pull and pull each other. The snake wants to go into a hole in the ground, the dog wants to go into a village, the hyena wants to go into a charnel ground, the bird wants to fly up into a tree. The monkey wants to go into a tree, the, the crocodile wants to go down into the, into the water. And so they're pulling. Whoever's strongest is going to pull all the other ones. Well, usually it's the crocodile who's strongest who's going to pull everybody down into the water where they all, the rest of them all drown. Otherwise you tend to go for whatever you like. But if you have a post and tie all the leashes to a post, the animals can pull as much as they like. And if the post is really firm, then they'll end up just lying down next to the post because they realize they can't go anywhere. And the post, the Buddha said, is mindfulness of the body, which means that when you're meditating, focusing on the breath, you're not in a different place from where you should be for the rest of the day. This is where you should stay as you get up and leave the meditation, go back to your resting place. Continue meditating. As you lie down to sleep, stay with the body. Think thoughts of goodwill for all beings, radiating out from where you are. Then when you get up, you're right here. And you can continue staying right here. And we learn how to stay right here with a sense of ease and well-being. Because a lot of times the reason we go for our likes and dislikes outside is because we're hungry inside. The reason we say stupid things just to get a laugh is because we're hungry inside. We're lacking something inside. So see these things as a kind of hunger and then realize, okay, I can assuage that hunger by the way I breathe. Make a survey of the body. See, where there are patterns of tension that you can release. A lot of times they're on the, around the backs of the hands, the tops of the feet, around your eyes, in the neck. Release what you can, so there can be a sense of ease as you go through the day. To get into the image of the school, it's like you never really leave school. You take the lessons that you've had time, you carry them with you wherever you go. That's the whole idea of having a school. It's not that you just have a school to pass the tests and then are done with it. There are lessons to be used. If it's a really good school, and the Buddhist school, of course, is the best school, the lessons are meant to be used all the time. Remember when I was teaching in Chiang Mai, I taught a course in early 20th century novel taught the kids how to do a term paper. Then the next semester one of the students was taking a course with another American teacher, a Peace Corps volunteer, and he had to write a term paper. And he came to me and said, how do we do a term, term paper? And I said, well, I taught you last time. He said, you expect us to remember that? That's the wrong attitude towards your education, and it's the wrong attitude to your meditation. Meditation has a certain set of rules that you follow, not only when you're sitting here with your eyes closed. You're learning restraint. You're learning intelligent restraint. You're learning comfortable restraint. Restraint with a sense of nourishment. So you can maintain that restraint as you go through the day, keeping the mind nourished so it doesn't go nibbling after sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensations and ideas of things that it shouldn't be thinking about. So look at these lessons that you're learning as, as you're meditating. This is how you should be running your mind all the time. Somebody that is, you go out and engage with the world outside, you have to take into consideration what the world is doing too, and how you're going to be shaping your world. But it has to come from the same spot. Your mindfulness, your alertness, your ardency right here. Try to make sure that whatever you do, say, and think is going to be skillful. 
You think about the consequences. So try to exercise some restraints. Try to be circumspect. Learn how to do it while you're here in the classroom, and then continue those lessons as you go through the day.